I am very happy to say I'm with songwriter and producer Pete Bellotti. How are you, Pete? I'm very well indeed, thanks, Phil. We're celebrating Donna Summer's The Wanderer album, which is 40 years old this year. Yes. And to prove it, just over here, is still shrink-wrapped from 1980. It must be an evocative release for you, because it's, I, I would yeah, imagine, it's... bringing back memories for you. Yeah, it's been... In fact, I was just talking to Ellie, my wife, about this. This has been such a fantastic year um, for all sorts of reasons with Donna. It's been really interesting and a lot of fun. And now, now to have this come out as um, a 40-year anniversary makes me feel really young. That's really good because obviously uh, it's a crazy year for, for many reasons, but the pandemic is causing lots of problems. This music, we need this, this magic more than ever. Well, one thing's for certain, the music we're hearing on the radio mostly now is, is all pretty much up. No one's doing any shoegazing at the moment. That's, that's what we need. We need more of that. Yeah. So it's been re-released for the special 40th anniversary. It is more than a reissue, though, isn't it? Because we've got the, you know, obviously we've got the coloured vinyl. We've got lots of new interviews and sleeve notes, which you've contributed to, of course, because you're, you know, hugely responsible for this release. H how do you feel looking back? Has it brought back a lot of memories for you when you were when you were delving back into it? I, I hadn't listened to the album for quite a while, properly. That was good fun, re-listening to it, because you listen to it, from a distance, you you don't feel as if it's yours somehow. You're you're listening to someone else's property almost. So you could be a bit more objective about it. But I, re I really enjoyed it, and um, yeah, I'm very pleased with it. I don't think there's much that I would want to change on it, really. To be quite honest, that's really interesting to hear because that was going to be one of my questions: whether you you know, in hindsight, you go back and change any of it. But obviously, the critics were were, you know, really positive about this when it was released. It came at a difficult time, though, because it was 1980, obviously, just after the, you know, the disco demolition night and the riots. D d does it yeah. feel uncomfortable for you with that in mind when, when you've got those memories? Because it was quite a tricky uh, time. I've sort of got over that bit. Um, I, I remember New York very well. That was probably about 1980. It would have been, yeah. Um, there was graffiti everywhere. Disco sucks. So I knew at that, that point um, that that was kind of the end of traditional disco. But we were, we were already, with the bad girls, um, moving away and putting Donna into a, a di different area with the style. And, and, and that's what we were doing with um, The Wanderer, is just trying to keep it, get it more into a, a, a pop rock area. The, the Wanderer, it had a bit of a, a rough start, really, because just before it came out, there was a bit of sabotage from Casablanca Records, who Donna had just left and joined Geffen at that point. And they put out a Greatest Hits album, sort of on purpose, because they knew this was just coming out. So that kind of didn't help. What also didn't really help was Geffen didn't really put a lot behind it. I never really knew why he signed Donna and us, because he didn't like disco there wasn't the push if, if that had still been on Casablanca I think we would have done as well as we always did um, because Bogart was a fantastic record man and got behind everything but there was there wasn't a lot of promotion on this album at all as you know we did a, another double album with Geffen um, which he didn't like at all and, and that's when he dropped us and took Donna to Quincy which was okay, and we weren't sore about that at all. That was just people leave producers and producers leave artists. It's um, just part of the life. We'd had a really good run. This was the start, I guess, of, of, the, of the ending of it all, really. So when, when you listen back and, uh, and during the time of making this, this album as well, um, what memories do you have? It was great. Um, all through our whole Donna career, we'd never had to deal with budgets or time. And they never existed. So we never had any pressures ever. And this went on with Geffen as well. He never put a budget on us. And like Neil Bogart, he never came down to the studio ever. So we were just free to do as we please, which we did. And in our traditional way, we only had enough songs for the album. We never never had too many songs. We just wrote 
for the album and wrote specifically at the time. So we would always write in the studio and then record. So th there wasn't any pre-planning. And this was probably a, a bit like Bad Girls, but there wasn't a theme because we'd always done theme albums up, up until then. So here we were doing all sorts of styles and things that we wanted to do. So it, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of the greatest musicians around playing for us. It was recorded at Westlake Studio, which is, and we were in Studio A, which is the, the Thriller Studio. So we were in a, a good place. We recorded there a few times. Uh, so we had the best studio, the best musicians, and we've always, always got along extremely well. Lots of laughs. Donna, Georgia, and I have never fallen out over anything, ever. Never had any of the rock and roll tips in the studio. So we, we just had a, a really pleasant time. It sounds like the perfect working relationship and quite liberating experience when you talk about uh, not having those rules, the boundaries that you may have previously had. But I did read somewhere online, I think it was about your working relationship and the fact that sometimes you actually forgot that you were working and you looked at your watch and had to dash back into the studio to start recording stuff. Oh, uh, this, this is Donna, the, the typical Donna. She would always, always come in the studio and have a long chat. She loved to talk. And she would come in usually for one song each time we'd, we'd got the, the track finished. And so she'd chat and chat and chat, and then, then she would. She'd suddenly say, I've got to go quick. And then she'd go in the studio, and she'd do it in one take, and she was gone. And the next time she heard it, it was on the radio. <laughs> Amazing. A true professional, if you can get it done that quickly. Yeah, oh, she was fantastic. And um, she was always very pleased with what we did so it, it was quite a unique experience you know having known so many other people with not necessarily unhappy experiences but but slightly difficult or tougher ones sure and, and a sorely missed artist you must miss her as a, as a friend too she, she was a lovely girl she really nice um she's intelligent very very funny just loved to talk she loved to impersonate as well um, Who did she impersonate though? <laughs> did she impersonate you? Because that could be a bit more personal. <laughs> well, she, no, she, well, she, did. she would often come up with a British accent um, <laughs> in an American way. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I love it. Now, I met and interviewed uh, Giorgio back in 2015. I just thought he was such a charming man. He really is nice. We've had so much fun over the years. Um, I spoke to him a couple of days ago. He's down in Italy avoiding the virus. It sounds like the wrong place to avoid it, but he's up in the mountains, so he's okay. I, I've met pr practically only nice people. Um, very rare that I've come across anyone, except for perhaps Jacques Morales from, um, what were they called? Village People. Village People, the producer. Because oh, right. yeah. I got into a lift one day in America, and he, he was in the lift. I, I didn't know him from Adam. And I had a belt on with JBL for the speakers. And he looked down at my belt and then he looked at me and he said, you know who I am? I said, no, I, I don't, I'm afraid. He said, I am Jacques Morales. And then the lift opened and he stepped out and the lift closed. And probably the biggest ego, ego meeting I've ever had. Quincy, who I got to know very well, a lovely, lovely man. And all the musicians, you know, because they're all so talented, um, I don't think they've got anything to prove. You know, they're just all, all absolutely lovely people. They've all got a very, very good sense of humour. Even Frank Zappa, you know, who doesn't look as though he'd make you laugh. But, but, yeah. I've got to tell you that I Feel Love is still, and it remains my all-time favourite dance track. Um, you, of course, co-wrote and co-produced it. But, it, but it's a track that still to this day is hugely influential. You know, bands like the Human League and Blondie, David Bowie was a massive fan of the, of the song. It must feel great to, to know that so many people have been affected by this song because it still sounds like a heartbeat to me. It sounds very much alive when you hear yeah, it. Yeah, one of those lucky moments in recording, I think. It was the last track on the album. It was just another track on the album at the time we recorded it. Um, because we tried all different genres on that album from the past to the future. And when it was finished, um, we, we never thought of it 
as even a single at the time. And then Bogart, the magic Bogart, he heard it and he suggested three edits and uh, which made great sense. I mean, he was a, such a record man and um, yeah, the, the rest is history, I guess. And it just, the song has grown over the years somehow. Um, it, it just seems to become more and more important to more and more people as it goes on. So very grateful and uh, very humbled by it, by the whole experience, really. It still sounds futuristic, which is amazing now, even in 2020, it sounds, still sounds like the future. Well, I, I always give credit to the, a man called Robbie Vedel, who was the programmer. He was a, a, um, a German programmer, because that was the first time we'd used the, 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 uh, the big three-piece synth from Moog. And he was the man, Robbie Vedel, who had figured out that you could sync tracks. And he worked this out on this Moog, and even Moog himself didn't know you could do it. Without this man and this syncing, because the syncing obviously made it so robotic, which had never happened before. So that's why it all locked in. Um, so there was no human element to, to move it around at all. So, and of course, he got such fantastic sounds. You know, they're all the sounds we were asking for, but we, we couldn't have programmed it. I mean, it was such a complicated looking machine. So it was just lucky that at that moment that we were looking recording a song about the future and this man came in in a tweed suit who was just a, 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 quite a techno bavarian and he had this wonderful gift and then we got this very low end track together and then donna comes in with this wonderful f falsetto and the juxtaposition just came straight away because she came in and that's where she went straight away. She didn't go into a normal voice. It's a very ethereal, kind of surreal voice, isn't it? It's a very floaty voice. I always think it's the, the inhuman heart, uh, the, the inhuman person is the machine and she is the, the, the heart singing over it all. It's just, um, yeah, it's fantastic. It's really nice to hear you giving credit to other people as well. I often wonder if songwriters and producers, uh, I'd like to hear your thought on this as well, get get the credit that they deserve. Obviously, you and Giorgio have both, both had a lot of credit, but do, do, do you think it's enough? Because I, I think sometimes the artists, you know, obviously because they're the front person, they, they, they probably get, get a lot more maybe. A lot of people who don't get credit are the actual studio musicians who come in. Um, because sometimes you'll have a track. I mean, obviously, on I Feel Love, we didn't really have anyone else, um, except for Keith Forsey, who played the bass drum on it. Um, that's the only bit of human music on there, and, and Donna, of course. But when you, when you have a, a sort of a four-piece section in to put the backing track down, what very often happens is you give the guitarist the line or, or the feel or how you want to play it and you, or you demonstrate it and he does it. And then he'll say, what about if I do this? And then the bass player said, well, I could, you know, just put a couple of it. And then somehow there's another magic, magical element comes into it. And, um, and it finishes up and you think, God, that, that's really good. It's not exactly how I would have done it. And so, so there's a lot of other things that, that happen. And of course, in the mix as well, you do things that you hadn't hadn't planned. So there's just lots of serendipity going on all over the place, really. That leads me on to the remixes on this Wanderer uh, release as well for the 40th anniversary. How do you feel about tracks being reshaped and remixed? Uh, and sometimes these tracks sound completely different to the original. Are you quite excited by that, that oh, idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, ab absolutely for that. Because, I mean, I can't go back, obviously, 40 years and say, this is... We might have done it like that because that's nonsense. But to have you know younger guys come along and and, and do it the way they want to do it and uh, in a completely different way than you know, ever thought of is fantastic. Yeah. And it's a it's a wonderful tribute, you know, to someone wants to re-record something or or remix something. And I suppose it opens up the audience as well, potentially to people that haven't discovered your work previously. Yeah, yeah, no, it's. No, it's brilliant to, um, to know that there are these, you know, big, well, not at the moment, of course, because that's all over with the virus, but, you know, to, to know that you have these stadiums sometimes with 
three or four thousand kids all waving their arms to one of your songs that's been remixed is couldn't be a, a nicer thing to happen. I've got, I've got a question actually from uh, a guy called Chris in London, which which is connected to to what we were talking about just there about you know obviously songs coming back again. Um, disco has never been so contemporary since since the eighties. Uh, what do you think about dance music's ongoing revival of the genre? Asked Chris. I'm sure that with you know Dua Lipa and uh, where there are so so many girls who have come along now taking taking influences from that. And what I like about it really is because because it's all up, up, and particularly at these times that we're in at the moment, you know, I think people need, it sounds a bit corny perhaps, but I, I think people like to have music that's uplifting. I don't think anyone wants to skip, go home at the moment and listen to Leonard Cohen, you know, um, and get morose. I just, you know, I, th- I think it's great just to have uplifting dance music that makes you want to move and smile and that it's connected to disco is, is, is fantastic. It's obviously quite different, but there is that element and uh, yeah, I think it's fabulous. Yeah, you can definitely hear the influences, can't you? Which, which is which is a good thing. But obviously, people who work in the arts and entertainment are, are feeling frustrated and worried right now, especially with the government here in the UK. And uh, obviously, you're you're back in the UK now. You've been living here now. Uh, would you give any advice to any any people, particularly young people, who are thinking of working in the industry because it's such a tough time, isn't it? Overall, I mean, my my advice to any musician is: you're a musician. You don't want to do anything else. Um, Keep going and use this period as a productive period because you know, there's a lot of downtime and in this downtime you could probably go through four years of experience very, very quickly, especially with your writing and your playing. It's a, I don't say it's a wonderful opportunity because that sounds terrible with the disease around, but it's, it's a it is a big opportunity to to hone your craft. There's that lovely um, saying from Beckett, ever tried, ever failed, try again, fail better. And that is the biggest and best advice I've ever heard for, for, for writers, musicians, engineers. This is a year when you could come out of it at the end of it as a fully fledged engineer and you've only been messing around in a Mac, you know, take the opportunity. I love that. And I think people are going to really find that a support because I think a lot of people need to hear those words. So I think it's quite, it's quite an important thing. How, how are you spending the time at the moment though, Pete? Are you, are you in a good place? Hopefully you're, you're still creative. Are you, are you still having the time to do Oh something? yeah, yeah, still. It's something you can't stop. My whole life, I've, I've never gone to the piano or picked up a guitar and played a song by anyone else ever. This is a, another tip I could give people perhaps. The moment I pick up a guitar, I try writing something else. And, and I'll write a song every, every time I pick up something. And of course, you know, nine times out of ten, the song you realise a few days later isn't that great. Because everything you write at the time is fantastic. You know, it's because you wouldn't be doing it otherwise. And that's what I say, every time you pick up a guitar, try and write something immediately. Don't, don't sit there playing other people's songs. Let other songs come into you th- through your ears and immerse. You, you don't need to sit down and work out the chords and how they do it. Just listen to it and then do your own thing. You know, that, that, that's what I would say. A- another tip I had as a young kid was that there was a rock and roll singer called Fats Domino. He was a kind of um, a New Orleans rock and roll pianist. And he always came up with great songs and great ideas. And someone said, how have you come up with those song titles? And he said, well, all I do is listen. If you listen to people talking, all the song titles in the world are in people's everyday demotic language. He probably might not have said demotic, but uh, <laughs> in everyday language. And, and it's true. I mean... I've carried notebooks around with me all my life and I'm all, I've always been listening. And, and that's another thing I'd say to any musician, and it, which is great now with the, with the phones, etc. Wherever you are, any idea, don't say to yourself, oh, I'll pick that up when I get home because 
you can forget it. Um, write down everything, keep a notebook with you and your phone, and just keep composing wherever you are, you know, because you never need to be bored, ever. There's, you've got a world of creativity in your head, use it. That's such a great way to finish this interview, Pete. I, I, I'm so grateful for your time. I wish you all the best with the 40th anniversary of The Wanderer. It's really good to listen back to it as well. It still it still sounds like an album that we need, you know, in 2020. So I wish you all the best with everything and hopefully... Well, we'll thank you, Phil. We'll see it's what you're up to next. Pleasure to speak to you.